So this is my last lecture, the fourth lecture. And in the first three lectures, I presented theory of cosmological perturbations and uh, various uh, models of the very early universe. And uh, I also showed you that we in cosmology have lots of data. So I think what I told you in the first three lectures was more or less honest. Uh, I sort of presented models of the very early universe, and for each model I tried to present uh, advantages, successes, and also problems. So now in this fourth lecture, you have to allow me to be a little bit partial. Because in this fourth lecture, I will present to you my favorite model of the very early universe. So obviously, I'll try to persuade you that this is a good model. But this is, you see, my personal bias a bit. So you have to take this into account, but hopefully it will be at least entertaining. So um, as we heard um, in yesterday afternoon's lecture, string theory is mathematically only consistent in nine spatial dimensions. And so in the first part of this lecture, I will st study certain aspects of cosmology, of background cosmology, if we assume that space is a nine-dimensional torus. So I consider uh, the topology of a torus because this is the simplest topology and it is the only topology I can think about with my limited mathematical background. So R will be the radius of the torus and it will be the radius of each of these nine toroidal dimensions. So this is my background. And I will assume now that matter is not a gas of point particles, but it is a gas of strings, with all of the excitations described uh, yesterday. Okay, So I first want to show you that if we start from this point of view, that matter is a gas of fundamental strings rather than a gas of fundamental point particles, you can get very different things. So since I am not a string theorist, I need some help. And demonstrations are always great help. So I want you to imagine the fundamental object as a fundamental string, an indivisible fundamental string. Okay. So now this string has modes which point particles do not have. It has oscillatory modes. Point particles do not have oscillatory modes. All point particles have is center of mass motion. Now, a superstring also has center of mass motion. But in addition to center of mass motion, if space is toroidal, then again, as we heard yesterday afternoon, strings have winding modes. And these winding modes can do something to space which point particles cannot do. So imagine that this is space. Okay. Now, a string can wind space and prevent it from expanding. Point particles cannot do that. So I'm going to try to develop a cosmology making use of the new degrees of freedom that string theory has that point particle theories do not have and also using the resulting symmetries. So this is my goal. So let's look at the, so I'll take a gas of fundamental closed strings, like the ones I demonstrated. And then we have degrees of freedom. So we have what I will call momentum modes, center of mass motion, and uh, on a torus of radius r, these center of mass motions have energies which are quantized in units of 1 over r, where I set the string length equal to 1. And then there are the winding modes. And their energies are quantized in units of R. 
the more times a string wind space of radius r, the larger the energy is. So we have em equals m r. So n is an integer, and m is an integer. Okay. Then we have the oscillatory modes, the many oscillatory modes, which we heard about yesterday. But their energies are independent of r. Again, if you paid close attention yesterday afternoon, you saw that the radius of a torus did not arise in the oscillatory mode. Good. So now we have a symmetry of the space of these states. If we take r going to 1 over r in these string units, and we interchange n and m, then the mass spectrum is unchanged. So this is one very small corner of this key duality symmetry. OK. So I should give a reference. So these considerations were all done in prehistoric times. Then in a paper by myself and Kumun Waffa in 1989. So I should mention that this paper originated uh, in discussions that we had. We were both junior faculty members at that time. Um, we were both trying to see whether inflation can emerge from string theory. And we concluded that uh, based on fundamental principles of string theory, we didn't see inflation emerging naturally, but we stumbled on this. Good, so degrees of freedom and symmetry. So now, as you know, in quantum mechanics, we define position operator in terms of momentum. So a position operator can be defined in terms of uh, integral uh, dp, uh, but p is uh, quantized sum over p, d to the i p x. P. So if you have momentum eigenstates, you have the usual position operator. So this is usual uh, going from momentum space to position space. But you see, in string theory, you have a completely equivalent um, quantity, namely the winding. So what you can do is you can define a dual position operator in this way. So this is the dual position operator. Good. And there's nothing, based on this symmetry, there's nothing preferential about x compared to x tilde. So now these position operators have different um, periodicities. This has period R. This has period 1 over R. Okay. Now, uh, another feature is that if R is much bigger than 1 in string units, then these are light and these are heavy. So if you imagine an experimentalist who's trying to measure distance, this experimentalist will have to construct measuring sticks. And the experimentalist has a limited amount of energy. So for r much greater than 1, the measuring sticks will be constructed in terms of the x. But if r is small compared to 1 in string units, then the x's are heavy and the x tildes are light. And so, therefore, for r much smaller than 1, measuring sticks will be constructed in terms of the x tildes. 
So So someone who measures physical length for r much greater than one will measure it in terms of the axis, but for r much smaller than one it will measure it in terms of the x tildes. So if we now imagine that our background shrinks from large to small. And you ask, what does a measuring stick measure? Then the measuring stick will measure this. So as the radius of this topological space shrinks from some large number to 0, the physical length is completely non-singular. So LP is non-singular. Never reaches zero. So in this lecture, I'm going to try. So the bottom line of my lecture is that based on symmetries and new degrees of freedom of string theory, you should automatically expect string theory, string cosmology to be non-singular. And this is a hope that you reflected yesterday as well. And so here you see one aspect of it. Good. So now let me include the uh, oscillatory modes. So now let's consider thermodynamics. So let me take a box of strings. a string gas, and I will take the size of the box to zero from some large value, and I will plot as a function of log of the radius, I'll plot the temperature of this bar. So temperature as a function of radius. Now, due to the fact that there are these infinite tower of oscillatory modes, which was explained yesterday, um, there's a limit in temperature. The Hagedorn temperature. This is the maximal temperature. So let me put this here, T sub H. Okay, so if you start with a large box of strings, then the en and thermal equilibrium, then the energy will want to be in the light modes. And at large are the light modes or the momentum modes. And so here you'll have some temperature. And in, at, in this state, the, the uh, strings will be in momentum states. Now you shrink the box, the momentum modes gets, get heavier, the temperature rises, like in point particle theory. But once you get close to this Hagedorn temperature, you have enough density to excite the oscillatory modes. So at this point, when you further decrease the radius, the increase in temperature will level off because you're exciting the oscillatory modes. And you'll never quite hit the Hagedorn temperature. So now you, when you hit the string scale, then it will become efficient for the energy to flow into the modes, which are light at small on and into the winding modes. And there's a duality symmetry, which tells you that the this is the way that the temperature will go. So as R decreases from a large value to 0, the temperature will never reach a singularity. So the conclusion is that the temperature is non-singular.
So this was thermodynamic considerations. So now let's imagine some R of T. Let's try to put in dynamics. Now, in terms of this R of T, you will see there are two possibilities for the temperature as a function of time. No, I'm in, I'm in nine dimensions. Yep. Space is nine dimensional. So you could think that I'm crazy because we see space to be three dimensional. But wait, just wait a minute. Wait a couple of minutes. I will address this question. OK. So um, good. I don't have equations for R of t. This is the Achilles heel of what I'm going to present here. But let's imagine one possibility. One possibility is that as a function of time, R just increases monotonically. In this case, what you will get is you will get something like this. So that's one possibility. And this, this maximum temperature is close to the Hagedorn temperature, so, but below. So this is the blue curve. But there's also the possibility that you kind of start here. And this looks very much like a static, quasi-static point. You have equal probability of going this way or going this way. So this is like a mountain with a very long, flat plateau. And you will eventually roll off in one direction or the other. And it's completely symmetric which one you go. So let's take this. In that case, you will get this. Okay. So these are the two possibilities that you have as temperature as a function of time. So again, the temperature will be non-singular. So now I will come to your question. So let's, I will now take this red track. So I'll pick T of T, this red track. Now, question is what triggers the decay of T of T? What triggers this transition? And what triggers this transition from the point of view of strings is the decay of string winding modes into something that has no winding modes. So as long as you, the gas of strings is full of winding modes, then you will have a static configuration. And I will illustrate this here again. So as long as you cannot break these strings, then space cannot expand. Space is tied confined by the strings. Space cannot shrink because we have momentum modes. So there's a stable configuration for the radius. Stable configuration for the radius are about string scale. But what can happen is that these strings can break. But I cannot cut these strings with scissors because these are fundamental strings and not true strings. So the way that this transition happens is by having two winding modes intersect and produce two loops. So again, this is identical to this because it's, it's a torus. This is a mechanism that will cause this transition. And now you see this means that, so these strings are relativistic objects. They are moving in space-time. They are tracking out two-dimensional world sheets. And two-dimensional world sheets can only intersect in four space-time dimensions. And so this process will liberate exactly three dimensions of space, and the other six will be confined forever. 
So this is the transition that will liberate three dimensions. It will allow three dimensions to become large. The other ones will remain small. So this is how we go from T9 to small T6, large T3. So you should be happy now. So I'll answer your question. So now, for those of you who follow string theory, this mechanism automatically stabilizes the size moduli of string theory. So if you try to do string cosmology by forgetting about the strings, by just taking quantum field theory, point particle field theories, motivated by string theory, you will have eliminated this mechanism. And then you have to work very hard to stabilize the size moduli. Size moduli are automatically stabilized in this approach. You can also introduce an angle in the torus, in a two-dimensional torus, theta. And then if you take into account the fact that these winding modes are there, that there are momentum modes, that all three dimensions are expanding, you'll find that this theta does a harmonic oscillator equation, a damped harmonic oscillator equation with ground state theta equals pi over 2. So I think that the shape moduli are also automatically stabilized. But the caveat is that I don't understand shape moduli well enough. So I only can show that this one shape modulus is stabilized. Yeah, maybe you, maybe you can do that. I can. This goes beyond what I can visualize. So we should talk about that later. So. Um, so after this transition, you have no winding modes about all three large dimensions. Um, that's right. So, so let's go back to this curve. So the winding modes only start to get excited once you pass here. But that's a gradual process. The thermodynamics is a gradual process. I will come to that to the specific heat later. Good. Okay. So, a consequence of all of this is that if you assume that string theory is correct, and you want to understand the early universe. You cannot use supergravity. And most people essentially use supergravity. Because if you use supergravity, you are forgetting about the crucial string modes. And you are also forgetting about the fact that there are two physical coordinates for each topological coordinate. So if you want to understand the early universe in the context of string theory, Please do not use supergravity, because then you've just thrown out the strings. OK. So this is the first part of what I want to talk about. So now I want to, I will come back to the background, but I first want to talk about fluctuations. And heterotic. <laughs> Why I can't use supergravity? Because I don't have I, I don't have winding modes. Yeah, and I don't have the dual spatial dimensions. So if you, want to cons if you want to do cosmology with field theory, and you want to base it on string theory, you, your field theory has to have 18 dimensions of space, 2 times 9. And a candidate for that is double field theory. Uh, 
Okay, so now what I will do is I will take the red track of the background, which I had before, and I will have oops, a long static phase at the Hagedorn temperature. And I have this transition that liberates three dimensions. So this is the background that I pick. This is my background. This is the red trajectory before. So I will assume this red trajectory. So now if this is the background and I draw the space-time diagram, because remember I had space, I always had space-time diagrams in my previous lectures. So this is this transition time, which I call T sub R, because this T sub R plays the same role as the reheating time in inflation. This is T sub R. So this is the Hagedorn phase, which is quasi-static. So the horizon is infinite. Um, this phase here is phase of standard Big Bang expansion, because once the string windings decay into loops, loops have an equation of state of radiation. So this is a radiation phase of standard Big Bang cosmology. So in this phase, the Hubble radius increases linearly. But before that, the Hubble radius goes to infinity. Now the horizon is infinite if time goes to minus infinity. So uh, the, now here I will draw the physical length of a fluctuation mode. This is a static phase, so the length is constant. This is radiation phase of expansion. And my transplunkian pro window for on lengths is way down here. So the fluctuations never enter the region where I don't understand the, the description. So the fluctuations avoid the transplunkian window of uncertainty. Good. So this is a space-time diagram. And I now want to take this space-time diagram and I want to compute fluctuations. And here I'm talking about work that was published in First Web Letters in 2006 by Ali Nayeri, Kromul Waffe, and myself. And then a follow-up work which Subodh Patil is also involved in 2007. Right. Yes, because the winding modes would, would if you wanted uh, to liberate a fourth spatial dimension, you'd have to have world sheets intersecting five large dimensions. That doesn't work. No, it's just, pro it's just prohibited. Simply. On a toroidal background, it's prohibited. If you take a, toro if you take a toroidal orbifold, then there is a decay constant. That, you, that depends on what the orbifold is. So I'm assuming that a winding mode is topologically stable. And obviously, on a sphere, it would not be the case. But on a torus, it is the case. So completely, so, so. Yes, there's a homotopy classification. You know, after, after this transition, yep. Good. Fine. So now in the two models, our universe models, which I discussed yesterday, inflation and the matter bounce, I was assuming that the source of perturbations was quantum vacuum perturbations. And in inflation, you can sort of justify this by saying that 
Before inflation, there was, a thumb, there was some kind of junk. Inflation redshifts that junk, leaving you with a vacuum state. That's a pseudo way of justifying vacuum conditions for inflation. In a bouncing cosmology, you can just assume by fiat that the universe starts empty, and therefore with vacuum perturbations. But here you see the whole scenario is based on the fact that we have a thermal bath of strings, not a vacuum. So the source of fluctuations is a is thermal string fluctuations. Whenever you have a thermal bath, you have fluctuations. And here you have a thermal bath of strings. So therefore, you have to use string statistical mechanics to give us the thermal string fluctuations. OK. So this is the origin of fluctuations, not vacuum, but thermal. So now the way that the calculation works is you, in the first step, you compute matter correlation functions. These string fluctuations. Step two, you compute the induced metric perturbations at T H of K. Okay, so this is my wave number K. T H of K is this temperature, the temperature that the gas has when the mode crosses the Hubble radius. So this here corresponds to a time when the temperature is Th of K. Now, you see, the temperature is almost constant in this phase, but towards the end, it decreases slightly. So Th of K is approximately constant, but slightly decreasing. And then step three is to evolve using the equations which I showed you in the previous lectures. Okay. So I want to make clear the, the three-step procedure that we follow. Okay, so now you can afford to get lost in the actual calculations. So I'm now going to compute the observables. I'm going to compute the cosmological perturbations, I'm going to compute the gravitational waves, I'm going to compute the slope of cosmological perturbations, I'm going to compute the slope of gravitational waves. I'm going to compute the four observables, the amplitude and the slopes, everything. And I'm going to do everything on the board. And it's simple enough that I can essentially do everything. So the metric is the metric that you've seen in my previous lecture. So I've used conformal time. I have the cosmological perturbations, which are described by, by this phi of x and t. And then I'm also going to <coughs> compute gravitational waves. So I'm going to do both cosmological perturbations and gravitational waves. So in this metric, I have to include the cosmological perturbations plus the gravitational waves. Okay. So this is the metric. It has a background. And that has the cosmological perturbations and the gravitational waves. Transverse traces. I'm working in T3 now. Because these are fluctuations. Because I had this thermal bath. Thermal, thermalization provides a homogeneity apart from the thermal fluctuations. And it's the thermal fluctuations that I'm going to calculate. So. This is the way that I'm going to do. You, you don't have to buy it necessarily, but this is the way that I'm doing it. 
OK. So now, the metric perturbations are induced by matter fluctuations. And using the Poisson equation, which you've seen before, the cosmological perturbations are given by the energy density fluctuations. So energy density fluctuations give you the cosmological perturbations and the gravitational waves are given by the off-diagonal pressure perturbations. OK. So in, if we want to compute cosmological perturbations and gravitational waves in string gas cosmology, what we have to do is we have to compute in this early phase this quantity and this quantity. Good. So now, um, this here is just energy density. So in thermal equilibrium, the energy density fluctuations are given by the specific heat capacity. So I take a region of radius r, the corresponding wave number is r inverse, and this is the energy density fluctuation in terms of a specific heat capacity. Okay, so far nothing stringy. Now comes the stringy input. If you have a thermal gas of strings, including winding modes, then the specific heat capacity has the holographic form. It is r squared divided by string length cubed. And here there's temperature, and here there's 1 minus temperature divided by TH. So this is string statistical mechanics gives us, so this is where string theory enters. And string theory assuming that there's a gas that includes um, uh, winding modes. And th so this is a stringy result. So this goes into here. This goes into here. We evaluate the temperature for each K mode here. And then we have the answer. So it's then three lines of algebra. And these three lines of algebra give you the result that the power spectrum of the cosmological perturbations, as I defined it in the previous lecture, is 8g squared, so the Planck mass enters, temperature divided by string length cubed times 1, 1 minus t over t sub h. So this is the result. Okay, this is the result. So for each K, this is the result. And this temperature here is the temperature when that mode exits the Hubble radius. I think. Well, see, temperature is always tied to matter. And if matter is a gas of strings, then yes. I don't see why not. So I'm certainly make, using this. And I think this is complete. In terms of this calculation, it's completely consistent. Because what I'm using is the temperature of the string gas. I'm never using the word temperature of the universe. It's temperature of the string gas. What I'm calculating is the power spectrum on a wave, fixed wavelength. So I think you should be happy. So now, you see that. At first sight, the, there's no k-dependence. So the spectrum that you get is scale invariant, roughly. But if you look more precisely, there's a t, and the t decreases slightly 
as you go to shorter wavelengths, which means that this factor becomes bigger and this factor becomes smaller, which means that you get a slight red tilt. Like in inflation. Okay, so the amplitude is set by the Planck length and the string length, by the ratio of them. Assuming for a moment that this factor is of order 1, you look, up, <coughs> you look up the favorite value of the string length in the textbook of the 80s, Green, Schwartz, and Witten. You plug that into here, and you get the Kobe amplitude of fluctuations. So no amplitude fine-tuning. You take the preferred stringy value for the, for the string length, you plug it into this formula, you get the right amplitude. That's right. But it's all post-diction. We did this calculation long after Kobe. So we have to do better. So we have to go on and also compute the gravitational waves. So let's do that. We compute the gravitational waves. And for that, we use the fact that Tij square of k, or of r, that this is given by T, temperature, divided by Ls cubed, r to the fourth, 1 minus T over T sub h. Okay. And not 1 over 1 minus T over T sub h. Now, for those of you who uh, have studied a little bit of string thermodynamics, the reason why this factor appears in the numerator and here in the denominator is that in the string gas partition function, there's a logarithm that involves this factor. And if you take the, if you take the derivative with respect to the temperature, which you do here, you get a 1 over. And if you take a derivative with respect to the distance, which enters here, then you get this. So this difference is crucial. It's not a typo on the board. It is a 1 over this factor here, this factor here. So now you plug this into P sub h. Again, a three-line calculation gives you that this is 16 pi square g square uh, 1 over ls cubed 1 minus t over t sub h. So this is a power spectrum of gravitational waves. And you see that this is, again, scale invariant. But instead of a slight red tilt, you get a slight blue tilt. which is different from what inflation predicts. OK. Good. So let's make a comparison. Between inflation and string gas cosmology. SGC C stands for string gas cosmology. So if you look at this calculation, we have two free parameters. This is the temperature that is reached relative to the Harkinon temperature. We have to treat this as a free parameter, because we don't have the ultimate theory. One free parameter here, the other free parameter is the string length. So we have two free parameters, but we are computing four quantities. And therefore, we have two consistency conditions, two consistency relations. Simple inflationary models also have two consistency relations. But these consistency relations are different. And so therefore, with observations, you'll be able to differentiate between these minimal inflationary models and string gas cosmology. Good. So, um, well, inflation, so I remind you that cosmologists use power law descriptions for the power spectrum. 
the scalar index answer best. And for some strange reason, the tensor index is defined without a minus 1. Okay, so what does inflation predict? Inflation predicts roughly scale invariant, but ns slightly smaller than 1. String gas cosmology predicts the same. Um, and t is predicted to be smaller than 1 in inflation because there's a consistency relation, which is nt is approximately equal to minus 2 epsilon, slow roll parameter, which is a positive quantity. We predict nt greater than 1. And our consistency relation is nt is equal to 1 minus ns, approximately equal to 1. So this is the inflationary consistency relation. This is a string gas consistency relation. And so we, there's also an expression for r. And we predict that r is about 1 minus t over t sub h square, which you can read off immediately from here. So we predict as amplitude, which is about 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4. OK. So bottom line is this basis toy model of early universe cosmology, which is based on superstring theory, makes predictions for observations, with which, which are now in, in agreement with the data. But in the future, you can differentiate. <laughs> So therefore, I think people who say that string theory doesn't connect with data is absolutely wrong. String theory will connect with data through cosmology. No, Gaussianity is good. So um, the matter is a gas of strings. So the, the non-Gaussianities are order one on microscopic scales, and they're Poisson suppressed on larger scales. Except if some super, cosmic superstrings um, persist to the present time. If some cosmic superstrings persist to the present time, then the Nogoshianis are exactly as we have in the cosmic string model. FNL is zero, but uh, there's a GNL, and you have a very nice pattern in position space. So yes, Nogoshianis, we, we know what they are. Those would be the cosmic superstrings. We would look for them like we look for cosmic strings, which are remnants of gauge theories. Oh, this is string scale. String scale is high. No, no, I don't. Still, I have a thermal state. I don't have a vacuum state. Okay. These are thermal fluctuations. Yeah, I'm using thermal fluctuations. Okay. Good. So now, actually, uh, I am slightly running behind time. It's very good that there were questions. I do want to leave you with one, one more thing. I, I should also mention we computed the running, and we find that the running in string gas cosmology is parametrically larger than the running in the simplest inflationary models. But this is not such a robust calculation. But anyway, we, uh, there are many calculations that could be done. We are the only group working on string gas cosmology, so not very much has been done. Luckily, we did the non gaussiani analysis. OK. Yeah. Good. So unless there are questions from students about this, I want to, for a moment, go back to the background. And I want to make connections with uh, what we heard about yesterday afternoon. Okay, so C will be background. And here I'm talking about two very recent papers. Um, and they are in collaboration with two Brazilians, Renato Costa and Guilherme Franzmann. So Renato Costa, he was a PhD student in Sao Paulo, and he's now a postdoc in uh, Cape Town. And uh, Guilherme is a student of mine, 
who's going to be graduating this year. So what we want to do here is we want to assume um, okay we want to argue again for the fact that the background is non singular and to do that we want to assume that the background is described by dilaton gravity But I want to um, extend the considerations. I don't want to forget about the dual spatial dimensions. So I want to take the dilaton gravity equations in R x dimensions, and I want to interpret the solutions in terms of the dual space. So I want to take dilaton gravity, and I want to interpret the solutions in double double space. So I want to consider both the x and the x tilde coordinates. Okay. So since I don't have much time, I will just say that what we do is we take the dilaton gravity equations of motion. In the presence of a matter source. So we have three equations of motion. We have the two, rel two equations from general relativity and the one equation from the dilaton. And we want to assume that um, matter has an equation of state which is that of a string gas. So it is 2 divided by pi d. d is the number of spatial dimensions, arc tangent of some constant beta log a over some constant a0. Okay. So this equation of state of matter looks like radiation at large r, like large a, and it looks like a gas of winding modes at small a. So therefore, this is a matter source from st string gas cosmology. So we take the dilaton gravity equations of motion. This is the equation of state of matter. And then we make an ansatz for homogeneous and isotropic cosmology. So parallel ansatz. We make rho is, uh, sorry, we make an ansatz for the scale factor, A of t proportional to T alpha, and the dilaton is proportional to beta log T over some reference time. And this phi tilde is the rescaled dilaton. D is a number of spatial dimensions. Okay. So this is the ansatz that we do. We plug it into the Littleton gravity equations of motion with this matter source. And then in the intermediate phase, which is the phase around A equals A0, where W is 0, then what we get is indices alpha, beta, 0, 2. This is string frame. Which means we get a static universe in the Hagedon phase with some growing dilaton. In the large A phase, we get alpha beta equals 2 over D. D is a number of space time dimensions. This corresponds to constant dilaton and expanding expanding. And then for the small r phase, small a phase, we get alpha beta equals minus 2 over d. And we get here a 
contracting. So in the string frame, what we get is the scale factor as a function of time. This is the time when uh, you have the Hagedorn phase, you get this. You get a bouncing cosmology in the string frame. Now, so this is a string. Good. Now, if you look at the A Einstein, you make this transition from string frame to Einstein frame, which we've heard from several speakers, then we do get, ah, I should mention something. I'm plotting this as a function of L and T, L and T. I'm not plotting this as a function of time. So time t equals zero is minus infinity on this plot. So we get uh, something like this. So in the Einstein frame, it looks like a goes to goes to zero. However, a tilde Einstein, which is, I can write the full metric ds square as uh, dt square minus a of t square dx square minus a tilde square of t dx tilde square. These are the dual spatial dimensions. This is 1 over a square of t. I get bouncing. So even in the Einstein frame, I get a bouncing cosmology, which, which has to be interpreted as you start at t equals 0 with the dual spatial dimensions contracting. You get to a point where dual spatial dimensions and physical spatial dimensions are equivalent. And then you get expansion of our physical dimensions. And physics in this phase, in this phase, looks like the physics in an expanding phase with a dual time. And if you interpret this in terms of this dual time, you find that time runs from minus infinity to a physically measurable time runs from minus infinity to plus infinity, and there's no singularity. So conclusion of part three is that even if you use background equations from dilaton gravity, taking into account string gas matter and taking into account the presence of the dual spatial dimensions, you get a non-singular cosmology. So bottom line of this lecture, I think that string theory inevitably will produce a non-singular cosmology. And if there is a long-lived Hagedorn phase, then you have a new mechanism of structure formation, which makes predictions for observations. But again, this is my favorite model. So you have to take it with a, with a lot of grains of salt. But uh, hopefully, you've enjoyed it. So the only place where I used superstring theory is in the specific computation of the T versus R curve and in the justification of, uh, if you really want to uh, ask me about moduli stabilization, there I use superstring theory. So it looks like everything I've done is bosonic superstring theory. But where bosonic superstring theory gives you things in contradiction with what I said were these two points. And specifically, I used, I needed heterotic string theory for both the T of R curve and also for the stabilization of the size moduli. This is heterotic string theory. But you see, a lot of the basic ideas are independent of which string theory. And it's those two places. So, so you see, if they are relic stable cosmic superstrings, they would achieve a scaling solution like cosmic strings. 
So we have the same kind of distribution. The only difference is intercommutation probability will be different. I thought you were going to ask a different question. I would. I, I, I thought you were you were going to ask why is this gas of things in the extra dimensions consistent with our late time cosmology? And there, the answer is in heterotic string theory we can show that it is. Now the process that you spoke about. The, I have not thought about this. I would assume that this is a rare process. But this might be possible. This is worthwhile thinking about. Yep. 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 That's a good idea. Naively, I would, I would expect that the rate is, is small, but this should be computed. No, no, because so the temperature in the the temperature, okay, the temperature in the Hagedorn phase is automatically close to the Hagedorn temperature, but yes, the exact deviation of the temperature from the Hagedorn temperature, yes. that has to be tuned, and the string length have to be tuned if you want to get both the amplitude and the slope of the scalar spectrum. So okay, I so tune those two parameters. In, right, but it's a. It, it's no no artificial tuning. So I don't see a connection, but this is my problem. So, so you're basically saying, what is there a connection between the work of, of Padmanabhan, Jacobson, and Valinder? And I don't see a connection, but that doesn't mean that there's no connection. In what I presented, there's certainly no connection. 